Welcome everyone to Classic Amateurs, a show where we are trying to convince each other that what we read is not so shitty and it's actually a classic. <laughs> Raz? Yeah, you uh, pretty good. Thanks, Norm. How are you going? I'm doing all right. So what do you think the ratio is between convincing each other if our readings, our the books that we cover are classics? How many times do you think you convince me to read your book or think that your book is a classic? Well, I'd say we've done about maybe six of these so far, roughly. I think at least once or twice I've touched a chord there. Especially with the Peter Thiel, I think uh, the road to the road to <laughs> entrepreneurship between zero and one. I think I might have struck a chord there and uh, lighting up your entrepreneurial ambitions. So, true, true. Sixteen percent. Are you convinced? <laughs> I, I'd say hundred percent. Everything you read sounds zero, like it. zero to one. I'm glad. I can't say the same about your recommendations, though. That's okay. I don't care if you I think it's good. <laughs> I think the point is that we don't, we're not really trying to convince each other. <laughs> yeah. This being said, today it's my turn to convince you that don't. what I was reading is a classic. I'm actually curious. So, what are you coming up with this time? I'm really curious. And I am interested in learning more about what you're reading because actually I, the more I spend time with you talking, the more I realize how complementary our tastes are. And I, I, I notice how, how much actually I'm learning about kind of, yeah, the other side of literature, fiction and nonfiction that I never knew existed. Talking to you reminds me of this girl I had massive crush on in high school. And when I finally managed to talk to her, I realized I had nothing in common with her. <laughs> but it's all about anyway. the journey to getting there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It's all about the lust, the lust for reading and knowledge. I'm sure that drove a, a, a huge change from personal development for you, getting ready to, to speak to that girl. You, you prepped, you probably le read a lot of classics during that period. And when you finally met her. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You, you had overshot. I think you overshot. I think you, you exceeded the true potential that was required for that relationship. It still hurts today. <laughs> Not as much as it hurts her. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, today talk is Strugatsky Brothers Roadside Picnic. Have you heard of this? No. Before? Good. So, have you ever heard of the movie Stalker? The Russian uh, um, Tarkovsky? Uh, I yes. I have never seen it entirely speaking of classic amateur i mean i know it's a classic movie at one point we will be end up talking about end up talking about movies i've uh, seen so many images of that movie it's in a way it is a stalking image of the bold russian guy but i have no idea what it's about is this related is this the the yeah. script is this the origin of that uh, idea yeah stalker is basically a movie adaptation a much more artistic adaptation of of the book Roadside Picnic. Mm -hmm. And Roadside Picnic itself is a is a pretty heavy, hefty book rather than heavy. It's not as long. And uh, just to give you a bit of synopsis and then we can have a back and forth, it is essentially about the aftermath of an alien invasion. But many people think it's about how technology corrupts people. And when I say many people, I mean me. Mm -hmm. I also read some opinions that it's about capitalism and how bad it is, which is possible. It's written by Russians, you know, in, during the Soviet time. So who knows? And some people, because of the stalker connection, thinks that it was essentially a precursor or some sort of prophesized the nuclear disaster of Chernobyl and just these massive sometimes technological and sometimes natural disasters. So that's a lot, that's a lot, a lot to take in. Yes. <laughs> so pretty much anything that's apocalyptic in nature, um, involving us or aliens <laughs> to some extent is described yeah, through that book. Anything. Absolutely. Because but, 
the book is a sci-fi and sci-fi, you know, you, you interpret it the way you want to. I mean, I remember, you know, my dad, um, from my dad back in the day, you know, the 70s, 80s, these, um, these science fiction books were really, really, really trendy, right? I mean, the, the, the fact that there was the race to the moon, everyone was uh, still competing for the space. Um, and I think yeah, at the time with nothing else uh, to, to, to kind of talk about in the, in the communist space, I think science fiction really captured everyone's imagination. But it's interesting how at some point things turned from uh, the promise of uh, a new world, you know, space exploration uh, to something negative, as you say, uh, dangerous potentially as well. So that shift in technology that I sometimes I hear Peter Thiel, again, going back to him, uh, mention is at some point we really believed, uh, you know, technology was the answer and would propel humanity into the next wave. And at some point we felt that as we do today, some of us, the technology is threatening. You know, we're afraid of AI and they yeah. will replace humans and, and aliens is just a, a, a step further in that there is uh, an intelligence out there in the space that is superior to ours that will eventually um, annihilate us. What was the, yeah, is that my, I mean, I'm obviously uh, ranting here, but do you want to share more about this book or is that? No, I enjoy to... your rant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can share. Um, I mean, just to comment on your uh, history of sci-fi, I, I think, yeah, I agree. It was big in the 60s, 70s, maybe in the 80s. And because there were two words there, right? We had the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc as well as the Americans. It had kind of like two branches. I guess there were more than two branches, but these were the two big ones. Uh, Americans were a bit more cheery, so they had Star Trek, they had Star Wars, you know, the good guys win in the end, even if there are sh shades and shadows in space. And uh, there was the Russians. And the Russians, as always, they are depressed. They are always uh, moody. <laughs> in, even when so they're in space, <laughs> drinking vodka and, they and yeah. uh, losing control of the yeah. mothership <laughs> as they roam oh, through space. <laughs> That's how it starts. That's that's the that's the best thing that can happen. Lose control of mothership. Just on that point around uh, the Americans, I think you you raised two almost two distinct themes ideologically: Star Trek versus Star Wars. I think if uh, Star Wars are the space cowboys, it's the typical Western that's just set up in a um, you know um, sort of uh, in the universe in the outer galaxies. It it is still a story about individuals and about uh, individuals conquering the unknown to some extent and fighting evil. I think Star Trek, which ran for many, many episodes, was actually kind of the, you, the dystopian view where, where we actually, computers knew everything to some extent. The role of the individual was kind of downplayed and it was a, a communist flavor in, within the US of, of something from what I understand without being a very, very close fan of that. Um, I'm wondering yeah. what themes, uh, I don't know how much you know about it, so the, the Russians explore in this, and in this case, um, is that... I and... love this because I don't really watch Star Trek, and by the sounds of it, neither do you. <laughs> but we are having so much opinion on it. Yeah, I only hear say. <laughs> hey, I'm an amateur. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. This is what the podcast is about. I don't anyway. pretend to know. I don't pretend to know what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah, so so I wonder how much can I spoil it? All the way. I don't care. Okay, great. So uh, if any of those don't want... You know, honestly, now that you've mentioned this, I will go and watch Stalker because it was on my watch list and I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated with Tarkovsky and I, I knew I had to watch it. It's kind of a bucket list thing. But I'm really curious about the book. I really want to understand it. I don't think it's going to spoil the, the experience of watching that or getting oh, immersed yeah. in that. If anything, it was going to help me entice me more and make it enjoy it more because it sounds pretty complex. So go ahead and just tell me more. I'm curious. Yeah. I, th I think the movie is, is better, honestly. It's a, it's a really good adaptation. And it's not like it takes themes out of it rather than the story. Like the story is different. So well, the thing with Tar Tarkovsky is that he doesn't, he kind of paints with images. And for him, narrative is not something explicit. You kind of let yourself be walked through the cinematic experience without yeah but a, a, sure. a book a book has to achieve uh the different different goals through different means so how did you experience it yeah i guess i guess the big one is 
like how to interpret the book, right? This is always the thing with books, like you can have like the top level interpretation, like Moby Dick is about a whale, roadside picnic is about uh, alien invasion and its aftermath. But then you start peeling off the layer and then it, the actual experience comes from whatever the deeper meaning is. So I guess if I spoil the top layer, it's not gonna be a massive issue. In a way, the title itself spoils it, Roadside Picnic. What do you think of a roadside picnic? Well, you know, I wouldn't, depends where that picnic is. If it's really on the roadside, it could, roadside. Be, danger, could be dangerous in terms of cars driving around and uh, splattering uh, asphalt over your, uh, uh, say, toast with peanut eh. butter or whatever you're having on your picnic. There's no peanut butter involved and there are no other cars, so it's not that dangerous. So this is how you can imagine, right? You pack up you, into your car with your family, you start hitting down the road and you, you drive for a few hours and then you decide you have a roadside picnic. You stop, you get out, you pull out your chairs, you pull out your, you know, little grill, maybe like a, a burner, some chairs, you know, some tablecloth, cutlery, whatever, and you just pack a picnic. It doesn't have to be literally next to the road, but it's, it's nearby, right? And then you're having a bit of fun and then you pack back up and then you leave, right? Makes sense. Sounds okay. It's not very interesting. It right? doesn't sound very exciting the way you present no. it. <laughs> no, because it's not. Uh, and now imagine this. Imagine the roadside is Earth, the planet Earth. And the people that comes to a picnic, the car that comes to a picnic is a alien mothership. What does this tell you about the relationship between the aliens and the and Earth? The car and the roadside. Are we, uh, you're saying we're kind of a parking lot slash pit stop for aliens having a picnic to some extent? Oh, well, Earth is, but people on Earth are, who are, who are the people on Earth in this metaphor? They are, are, we, are the forest are we, animals. The forest animals? I, I thought you were going to say yeah. the, the picnic food. <laughs> no, because the picnic food comes with the car, right? That comes with the aliens. But Fair enough. Yeah. Humans live there. Humans live on the roadside, and the roadside is inhabited by, you know, frogs, squirrels, eagles, whatever animals in the forest, right? In, whatever in, animals living nearby. Inferior species to, to, to as well, sure. what you're saying, if, the, if you assume the, the aliens to be smarter than us or superior. Sure. But as yeah. the driver of the car, as the person or the alien in the mothership, like how much shit do you give about the animals in living in the roadside? I mean, and to one extent, I'd see them as a threat uh, from a sanitary perspective, if not from a, you know, danger of being attacked by, uh, <laughs> if they're wolves or is anything it, else. Depends where, where, where is this, where is this picnic situated? Roadside. Is it, is it in Russia or is it in Africa or somewhere else? Cause it kind of depends <laughs> if it's okay. Australia, I'd no. be afraid of, of, of snakes and uh, spiders and other things. Before I sit on little, it. little roadside, roadside note, even in Russia, roadsides are not that dangerous. No, Russia is pretty key good. message. The key message is that aliens have invaded earth. They invaded earth from different places and they stayed on earth for about six days during six days. It might be a week. I don't remember. And afterwards they are gone. No one knows where they're gone, and there's no reason to believe that they even noticed humanity, because for them, humanity is just a bunch of forest animals living on the roadside and just curiously looking at whatever the aliens are doing, but never ever interacting with them. Hmm. But what happens after the picnic, right? The aliens leave the picnic equipment. They leave the burning oil. They leave the, the chair that's kind of wobbly. They leave uh, the cutlery that's kind of edgy. So some of the animals obviously wander in. They are looking for food or they're just curious. And then the eagle flies into the fork and then impales him. The squirrel accidentally licks the burning oil and dies. And for these animals, none of these makes sense. And for the aliens themselves, they are long gone. They don't give a shit, right? But that, um, sorry, I'm just surprised that of the immediate demise of these animals interacting with this technology. Uh, well, you'd, expe you'd expect no. them to be a bit more careful instead of just uh, throwing themselves in a, in a fork. <laughs> Sounds pretty stupid. Well, 
Well, not every animal, right? We are, we are only talking about a few animals. So, I mean, the roadside itself, the picnic ground is not massive or it's extensive. It's just a spot, right? Okay, sure. And most most seagulls, most turtles, most squirrels, most frogs are, are not interacting with this at all. But the few that does are fine and few that does die. So in the story itself, aliens attack, they leave, and whatever they leave behind is what they refer to as a zone. This is what Tarkovsky later used to imply Chernobyl. And the zone itself is what you would describe as an alien picnic ground. It's essentially packed with technology that no one understands. Some people interact with this technology and they are fun. Some people interact with this technology and have a heart attack the next day or they have kids who grow up to be monsters, or they go absolutely mad. No one knows what the heck is happening. And mm -hmm. the idea of this zone presented is that it's a source of technology innovation, but it's also an incredible corruptive force. Because whoever goes in and comes out alive, assuming they are alive, they have an incredible power in their hand, because they might obtain some items, some technology that might lead to the next big innovation, or not. And in the story itself, the zone gets closed down, you know, because they build a wall around it. Russians love to do that shit. And then they are not officially allowing anyone to go in. But the other thing the Russians are famous for is corruption. And a lot of people, so-called stalkers, hence the name of the movie, walk in and try to pick stuff up. Life is not great anyway. <laughs> and a lot of weird stuff happen. You know, in the beginning of the book, one of the guy walks into a golden web that doesn't seem to harm him, but later on he dies of a heart attack. The main character has a child who grows up to be a monkey. Then suddenly at one point, the dead return. No one understands why. And there are weird stuff going on. Generally, the book presents technology as a double-edged sword. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not. You know, it's that milk that's been in your fridge for a week, you drink it, maybe it's good, maybe it's not. So, you want me to continue? How do you feel about this? So I'm, I'm loving this. This is pretty, sounds pretty scary, <laughs> but also kind of fascinating. Yeah. It's great. The, the story is quite philosophical, right? As I said, the alien attack aftermath, it's barely talked about. Actually, it's talked about a lot, but it's not really like, it's not very action heavy. They basically describe it as no one knew what the heck was going on. And then they just chat about what the aliens really wanted and what the technology is about. And then they talk about how it impacts people how the main character's daughter is growing up to be a monkey, how a lot of stalkers, a lot of these people got rich, but their life become completely twisted out and they, they destroyed and they hate each other. It is pretty terrible. And then one more thing I'd add is in the very end, there is uh, um, something which you will probably uh, encounter one more time called the wish machine. The idea is it's a technology. It's a technology that the aliens left behind and a technology that brings your wish true, your innermost wishes true. What mm. this is, I have no idea. <laughs> they never explain it. But it kind of creates a very interesting narrative that goes from, oh, this is like just aliens to... What exactly is your goal with technology? How far you can go? What can you achieve venturing into, you know, the unknown? And what can you sacrifice for it? Hmm. It's this not a happy a, end, by the way. No, this is fascinating. You know, well, I just quickly uh, Googled um, Stalker and I realized I have seen this movie. And I, I have seen it. And the thing is, it's nowhere near what you describe it to me it wasn't at all the way you described it at, at no point in the movie you know do you have this explicit um description that it is an alien invasion uh that the zone yep. refers to uh the assets that the aliens left behind at the roadside 
but it is the story of I think three individuals uh, entering stalkers entering the zone and having yeah. these experiences, which at no point are, are explicitly related to um, to the assets or expli- explained in any way in terms of what they mean. They're just, but they are uh, very lyric, very dis- very um, yeah, just just very very aesthetic uh, representations of the things that you're mentioning, including relationship with time and the relationship between um, goals and technology that you just pointed out, which I think is absolutely fascinating. The technology as a double-edged sword and, and its use, um, or the purpose around its use, can determine whether it's a demise of, demise of individuals or entire civilizations or, uh, or their advancement to some extent, salvation. Um, yeah, uh, our, our generation, future generations, right? That's the the metaphor of the child becoming a monster. These decisions are not just our own, right? But maybe uh, impact the future as well as the past. I don't, I don't want to spoil the stalker itself. I recommend everyone to watch it. Um, but we can say that basically Tarkovsky took the wish machine. The wish machine was the bunker, basically, in in the movie, right? So he took that from the book the book itself treats it completely differently and it's it's not nice at all it's much worse than the the movie itself and then i guess the other one is a, a bit of like a soviet anthem playing in the background some people interpreted it as the metaphor for the corruptive force of capitalism because all the technology in the zone were material goods they were objects so many people saw it as, you know, materialism invading in the pure, clean heart of modern Russia, making all the good people bad. This being said, yeah. go ahead, tell me. No, no <laughs> I, I, I imagine, you know, uh, by then, by the late 70s, 80s, I think the paradigm had shifted a little bit. And I think... Uh, from an economic perspective, it was Russians knew what the West was about slowly, and they they were aware of the the huge um, uh, sort of uh, variance or delta to the, the Western world standard of living, and um, there was probably something uh, that triggered you know wishful thinking. I mean, the perestroika was just a few years later, and I think this was late sixties though. The book itself was way before that. Hmm. Even the stalker movie was seventies, so this was like like ten to fifteen years before all the hmm. all the economic reforms. Maybe that's the the value of the book in that case. I I see, I see your point is that the 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 intrinsic narrative here is something that a bit of a, an archetype that still applies to to humans in any context of history, and then this theme can just be reiterated to talk about the immersion of capitalism, as you say, uh, immer- or the impact of capitalism, uh, technological corruption, alien apocalypse, or Chern- did I mention Chernobyl maybe as well, or you know, cataclysms, uh, because maybe this is something that keeps on uh, repeating all the time to us in various chains where always on the side of the road yeah absolutely and uh, i mean and if you read uh, and if you read the book you see that the road to this you know salvation is incredibly difficult if not impossible and uh, i mean if i would compare with squid game from netflix that we recently watched it's, it's much much more rough than squid game <laughs> Wait, 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 riskier. And uh, I, I already the, see a, fu- a future. I can already see a, a Netflix adaptation of Stalker <laughs> after the success of Squid Games. <laughs> the I, the I stakes can, can be that. raised. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, um, one more thing to add is that from what I understood, uh, uh, the brothers that brought Roadside Picnic were not very political, like they were just writing sci fi. Now, this not to say, you know, they didn't mean it. Maybe they did. In Back in Soviet Russia, they would have probably been encouraged to write about the evils of capitalism. So maybe the one way to defend them is to say they should have been more explicit. But they weren't. So I don't know. I actually don't know. I enjoyed the book. It's 
it can feel a bit too lengthy at times because it's really, really deep in philosophy. Like, uh, you know, Russia, so they spend most of the time drinking and talking and complaining. And, so, uh, and, when, and what, the rest of the time dying. Can I ask you more of a personal question about the book? When did you read it? At what stage in your very long, lengthy life have you did you experience it? What drew you to it? I mean, how did it even end up on your on your bedside table, I'd say, because it's not the type of reading that people know about that much. No, or am well, I, I knew the movie. I knew the movie and I wanted to read a bunch of classic books. So I read like, this was about two years ago. I wanted to read like Dune. I wanted to read Broadside Picnic, Riparian, and some other like classic sci-fis. And, you know, I read them. And that, this was one of them. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense, actually. And uh, it's you can see that these themes reemerge now, right? Dune has just been released now as a movie and they do stand the test of time and they, they keep, uh, every time we're faced with kind of a, a technological wave, they, they, they reemerge one way or another. Uh, I wish I would different... have said Dune. <laughs> I, have a, I have a massive hot take on Dune, yeah? A big fan? No, I hate it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, honestly, I, I really, I really wanted to love it. I wanted to love it so much. And it, I started reading it after like 250, 300 pages. I gave up because I thought it, the whole book feels like it was written by a 12 year old boy. <laughs> it's unbelievable bad. And I heard that the movie is great. I saw the trailer. It looks awesome. And it's, it's got it's Chalamet that, in it. I, I have no idea. Honestly, I don't know how to feel about it. I might watch it. I might not. I like the director, but the story. Oh my God. Holy shit. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Why don't we end there? Because this is, uh, unless we're, we're planning on doing Dune next time, <laughs> up to page no. 200. And <laughs> no, I, honest, okay, so just to get derail this into Dune a little bit, I, I think the concept of Dune is great. And the word that Frank Herbert, the, the writer of Dune, created is awesome. You know, it's it's basically a Luddite utopia, right? It's, it's, a, it's a society that has that decided that innovation and technology is bad so they limited that and turned it turned their civilization into a basically a modern feudalism with some spaceships sure but it's mostly feudalistic and then they the whole thing is played in like in like a quasi arabic world because it's, it's in the in a sand planet right and everyone's miserable and everyone's fighting and I don't think this is a bad word. I actually watched uh, the TV series Dune, and I thought it was great. It's just a book. Oh my god! <laughs> How could anyone see this and be like, "Oh, this is great"? So I'm glad. I think this should be kind of the first uh, video we put out there for people, just to trigger our audience. <laughs> Holy shit! It's listen. It, it's just like I feel like I could write Dune. And I, I don't want to sound pompous. It's not because I'm a writing talent. I, I'm not. But neither does Frank. Neither is Frank Her Herbert, really. It's, oh, my. And, to, okay, to be fair, I only read the first 240 pages. Maybe after 240 pages, it turns into this amazing journey. Who knows? I, I don't believe that. I guess we'll never, we'll never know, but other people might tell us. <laughs> and maybe one day, you know, who knows? Maybe I should try to read it again. And if I hate it still, then I'll, I'm just not going to talk about it. <laughs> I don't know. But honestly, I might... the movie looks great. Anyway, go ahead. I might, I might watch the movie. That's what, all I wanted to say on this topic. <laughs> yeah, we can watch it together. Hey, for Halloween. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, well... uh, so what's your, what's your wish if you could enter the bunker slash wish machine? Oh, that's a very good question. So I have a few options, right? That are pretty good. Um, aside from a mutation of my child, which I obviously don't don't want. Um, time tree, you've got time travel. You've got hedonistic things. Uh, you could wish for a sort of a communist utopia where everyone's, uh, you know, well off and uh, maybe everyone's healthy. Stalin wakes up. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, or you kind of, I just wish, um, 
yeah, we live in a in a in a world that doesn't uh, self destruct, and we can continue having a bit of the same freedom that we have right now, maybe a bit more. And yeah. uh, we can keep on uh, making our own individual decisions about life. That sounds like a good, you know, good place to be in. So not not to not to uh, criticize any of your wishes, but both the movie <laughs> and the book, both the movie and the book uh, positions it as your most inner your innermost wish or desire, mostly focusing on desire. I'm not sure if you remember the movie, but. The idea of desire was that you cannot really say it. And what happens often is it, um, I'm trying to remember, like what happens is it almost works like the deal with the devil, you know, like you ask for something and it gets corrupted very quickly because the wish machine treats it very literally. So no one can really figure out how to use it, at least in the movie. And I think there are remnants of this in the book. Uh, I mentioned the dead returning at one point, mm-hmm. like the dead rise and just walk back. And it kind of alludes to that someone used the wish machine and wanted their loved ones to return to them. So what the wish machine did is that they, they sparked life with all these undead bodies. And the undead bodies kind of walked, mm-hmm. grow, got out of ground and walked home. But they were, they were undead, they were rotting. They, they, they couldn't talk, they, they, they lost most of their memories, you know, they were useless. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people realize it, it, it makes no sense. I mean, this and, is an, an, such an archetypal story. You find it in uh, fairy tales. I was, I'm reading to, you know, to my daughter and uh, about, you know, be careful what you wish for. You meet, you meet a midget in the forest, you meet the genie, you get three wishes. The first one is, oh, I wish I had some sausages. <laughs> and then you waste your first wish. And then the second one is, uh, this is a conversation between the couple. Oh my God! Oh, you're so stupid! You, you wasted our first wish. I wish these sausages would get stuck to your face, and then bam, your second wish gets lost, and then all yeah. you're left with is the third wish, which is I wish just things were back to normal <laughs> as they used to be, and that's how you use your three wishes. So sorry, this is just a, a fairy tale that I keep on reading to <laughs> to have all the yeah. time. I, I don't think anyone wishes for sausage either in stalker or roadside picnic, but you know, it would go well with the picnic. Well, the point is, no, uh, yeah. Be careful what you wish for and maybe, you know, don't take things so literal. Maybe, maybe sure. wish for things that are a bit more nuanced and not so obvious and hedonistic Yeah, and, and they might be worthwhile having. Yeah. So this was roadside picnic also doing also horror movies and some some children's stories about sausages <laughs> i loved it thanks i, I really enjoyed this one thanks so much <laughs> this is a classic people remember <laughs> all right okay stay classic. Stay, stay classic stay classic stay i'm 